it's not going to solve any problems if a couple of corporals or a couple of privates get put in jail. That's actually going to make it worse. Now, I'm hunting generals, not corporals. G'day. Welcome back to The Green Left Show after a bit of a break. Uh, I'm Alex Bainbridge for Green Left. Today we're talking about the campaign to defend whistleblowers from prosecution and persecution by the Australian government. In particular, the case of David McBride, who exposed war crimes by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. We do acknowledge at the outset that we are recording this show on stolen Aboriginal land. This is sovereignty was never ceded and it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, also at the beginning, I'd like to just say, if you'd like the work that we do, please become a Green F supporter. It is the number one way that you can support our work. And we're currently on a campaign to boost our supporter base because it's just, it's just essential for, um, for, the, for the maintenance of our work. So please, it's plan start from just $5 a month. Check out greenneft.org.au for more information. Now, onto the case of David McBride. Uh, the clock is surely ticking for David, who faces trial in November uh, for his role in exposing the war crimes by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. There's no ambiguity or doubt about this. The Brereton report in 2020 found without any ambiguity or any, any doubt that Australian soldiers were involved in war crimes. We're talking here about murders in cold blood. There was no combat justification for them. Yet in the three years since then, even though the, we were promised that um, those responsible would, would be held accountable, so far not one single person has faced any punishment uh, or certainly not even a prosecution or charges been laid. So far the only person that, uh, that, that risks prosecution at this point is David McBride. I want to go back to just to remember some of these war crimes that were committed. They're going to look back and see that we were the guys in there murdering and invading and not there to do something that is honourable. They are Australia's elite special forces. The lethal operatives of the Special Air Service Regiment, the SAS. For more than a decade, they were on the front lines of Australia's longest war. You try to look back at your career as try and be proud of it, but then you've got all these incidents. You see yourself as, as part of the bad guys. More than 70 organisations have joined the campaign to call for protections for whistleblowers and to drop these prosecutions against David McBride, as well as tax office whistleblower Richard Boyle. Writing recently in the Sydney Morning Herald, Macquarie Uni journalism professor Peter Grest wrote that, quote, the Attorney General has the power to drop the charges, reform whistleblower laws and protect journalists and their sources, including introducing a Media Freedom Act. Unless he does so, Australia will remain dangerously secretive to the detriment of all but the most powerful. Mark Dreyfus did exactly that in the case of uh, Bernard Colliery. He dropped the charges last year. However, David McBride has got no confidence that he will do the same in his case unless there is a massive increase in pressure. Dreyfus would like to drop my case, sure, because it's, it doesn't, he doesn't benefit anything from it. He can see if I get put in jail, it won't be that good for him. He'll have a lot of explaining to do to say why no people in war crime, why, you know, why is the guy who shot someone on TV that's seen all around the world, why is he not in jail yet? But why am I in jail? I mean, Dreyfus will, have, will struggle. And he's also come out saying, I love whistleblowers. <laughs> Look at my new whistleblower program. I mean, he's gonna get flack and he's not particularly brave. So um, he would, but apparently the only reason they dropped Caleri's case was nothing to do with Caleri. The spooks wouldn't drop it. Dreyfus said, this is bad for me politically. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it, was, it was easy for Dreyfus because it was totally LNP. It was totally uh, uh, Woodside, uh, Santos, uh, Downer. It had LNP fingers all over it. So it was an easy, it was an easy goal for them to score. So he, he wanted to drop Caleri's case. He made comments about it, but then apparently the head of ACES said, no, I'm not going to. We need to make an example of this guy because we don't care about Caleri so much, but what, what about the next Caleri? What about the next witness guy? We need to really scare people that they don't mess with the security services. And then um, the only reason that they dropped it apparently was East Timor said to Australia, 
F you, we're going to do a deal with China. How's that? How do you like them apples? <laughs> and then Australia said, oh, well, well, maybe we'll do a deal. Maybe we'll drop the charges against clearing. So it was, it was, you know, it was diplomacy. It was states, it, it was a states trading off uh, power, nothing to do with justice. In McBride's view, Mark Dreyfus buckled to pressure from the Australian Security Intelligence Service, ASIS, in the case of the Bernard Collery uh, prosecution. He was all set to push ahead with that prosecution until he suffered diplomatic pressure from Timor-Leste. And McBride believes the spooks are equally determined to prosecute him. In the same as in my case, and there is the prosecutor on one side um, who's been quite good, you know, the, the Crown prosecutor, they're not too bad. But the main people that give me problems in my case is the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the they call the Attorney General's department, but they're not the Attorney General's. They are um, the spooks pretending to be Attorney General's because they are part of the Attorney General's department. Decorated soldier Ben Roberts Smith lied about the war crimes that he was implicated in, according to the judge's ruling in the defamation case that concluded earlier this year. Initially, Brett McBride blew the whistle precisely because he could see that Ben Roberts Smith was being protected while the military brass were trying to make others take the blame. Yeah, well, it, it, it was, as I said, it was the, uh, the cover-ups. And, and, and I knew there were lots of rumours about uh, murders the year before and they weren't being investigated. And that was strange. We didn't investigate the, the now, as we know, 39 murders. And I, there's probably double that. I think a conservative estimate was double that. The Afghans who've been interviewed since, people that lived in the area, they said, we didn't report murders. Why would we? We knew you were all liars and cheats. We knew that the even, we did not even trust the NGOs. We thought you were all, um, you were all in it together. Uh, you were just gonna cover things up like you did every time. In fact, the guy, it's gonna help my case, um, as we talked about him on the radio show, he was the, um, the governor, the governor of the province and very pro-coalition. And of course, in ways that um, defy explanation, the Australian government wouldn't let this guy who'd worked hard for us, they wouldn't let him come to Australia. You know, isn't that despicable? You know, he was really in line. He was the governor of the province during our time. So the Taliban would have killed him. You know, he escaped to Turkey or something, and eventually he's here now. Uh, only because, some, not because of the government, but because a few service people worked uh, hard to get him here. So he's here now, and uh, he said yesterday or in the newspaper, he said, I reported murders, you know, all the time in 2012 and 2011, and the Australians did nothing. You know, and so and he's here in Australia now, so I might be calling him as a witness. In fact, there was one case when the Defence Minister, Stephen Smith, uh, totally ruled out of hand. It was one of Robert Smith's ones. And uh, the Af I think the Afghan president, Karzai, complained and, and Smith just said, oh, as if, as if that would have ever happened. <laughs> there was no investigation, you know. So you can imagine what the Afghans thought. Why bother? Why bother? And so, yeah, we know that this, the, Brereton said the 39 murders, I would say at least double that, probably triple. Um, but that happened in 2012 and there wasn't a single investigation. There still hasn't been a proper criminal investigation into any of them 10 years later. Um, so uh, that's weird. That's pretty weird. And they were pretty obvious um, some of the time. You know, Robert Smith took someone out the back and blew his head off. And uh, five people knew. Sometimes, and also when... Uh, they were putting a throw-down weapon like a um, AK-47 down on the dead body to say he was Taliban. Uh, they had to fly that weapon in by the helicopter. So the helicopter pilot, his buddy, everybody, you know, another five people know. And they all, they're, they're just normal. They all tell their best friends. So 50 people know. Um, their best friends tell their best friends. So everybody uh, knew and yet, in 2013, when people were starting to talk, I believe that um, uh, Masters and Mackenzie, who eventually exposed Robert Smith, did a good job, but I think they knew then. I, and I think the tit for tat that they got from the Defence Force, because they got a lot of inside information uh, as journalists, 
was that they wouldn't blame the leadership. They wouldn't. They would pretend that no one knew. No one, no one knew till 2017. Now I think that's unrealistic. Um, and uh, but they say that. So yeah, I, I couldn't understand why they wanted to prosecute people in 2013, but no one in 2012. And it seemed to me because they had a very famous uh, star player who was guilty of war crimes and they were just trying to uh, find scapegoats um, who nobody, nobody who, who weren't anybody's and they could quietly put them in jail and that would somehow satisfy the media machine. National security laws are a big issue in this case because they potentially limit the evidence that uh, David McBride is able to bring to court and also may mean that the, the, the court case may be closed to the public and the media in part, if not in whole. They also can manage to get a conviction surreptitiously by um, limiting the evidence uh, that goes in um, and um, yeah, not letting you call any evidence which could help you and um, uh, yeah, let, letting their own evidence go in. So yeah, that that is obviously there. This is one of the things about all the national security laws. They um, they're misused. You know, they're made they're, they're made with good good intentions, possibly. Um, you know, they're made with thinking about putting Osama bin Laden on trial or whatever they were thinking, but they're misused. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so that they can put people like me in jail without a fair trial. The day before my preliminary hearing, they came in and said, nothing is going to be allowed to be seen by anybody, even our witness David. And even Dreyfus apparently was surprised by that. Um, and what they do in order to win the case is they say all of their evidence is allowed to go in and none of my evidence is allowed to go in, <laughs> which, is, which is, you know, is pathetic, but that's 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 what they can do and of course they can close the court so no one hears about that so um, that's why I don't think I'll win the case but what I do think I'll win and that's why I'm so grateful to you people uh, for coming here tonight giving up time because I think I will eventually win from public support because people can see that that's bullshit you know and the government will think they're clever and they'll put out a statement and they'll put me in jail or whatever but the average, I've spoken to a lot of people around the country and they all say, really, you're the only guy with these complete disasters in the last 20 years and you're the only guy going to jail. I would like it um, to be a precedent to say the government can't legislate to make reporting a government crime a crime. Uh, and, and that such legislation, if they do that, is uh, unconstitutional. Uh, but I could see it being close in the High Court. Uh, a lot of it, it's a court of appearance. It is about the vibe, despite the, uh, the jokes of the, uh, the castle. It is actually about the vibe. Um, and I think that they would say, uh, I'd like to think that they would say that you can't put someone in jail for doing their job. Um, and particularly as a lawyer, and I had a practicing certificate. But it, I'd probably have to be in jail um, or those two two or three years while we waited for those appeals to be heard. David McBride squarely points the blame towards the military brass, not towards the rank and file soldiers. A lot of the soldiers did the right thing. And I, I, I always want to say that a lot of soldiers were very brave. I saw SAS blokes do very dangerous operations where they could have been killed at the drop of the hat and they had to go and arrest someone in a, in a you know, Taliban stronghold, and they didn't fire a shot. They arrested the guy, brought him back. They didn't kill anybody, let alone fire a weapon. That's brave. That's professional. I saw that, um, and I uh, I credit that. There were some really good people. It was like any kind of bizarre world. There were some really good people, and there were some really bad people, and you couldn't necessarily tell the difference by looking at them. But um, the good people, I've got enormous respect for. Um, and I'm really just doing the equivalent of them. I called it like it is, as I said, and, and, and we would be united in the same belief that it was really the leadership that would be the big problem. And that's what we're united about. It's not, it's not gonna solve any problems if a couple of corporals or a couple of privates get put in jail. That's actually gonna make it worse. Uh, the whole point of the Defence Force or any organisation is the people at the top take the blame, the people at the top take responsibility. Uh, I reckon they knew, and even if they didn't know, 
how could that not be incompetence? They were all very well uh, pinning medals on people and taking the reflected glory uh, when the war was going well. And then when things start coming out, they all run for cover. Now, I'm hunting generals, not corporals. And um, I, respect, uh, I respect a lot of the soldiers. Yeah, it's a lonely road. I'm not going to be invited back to the SAS Social Club. But um, saying that, a lot of people would say he's a pretty good guy, you know, he, he did what he believed is right. And um, that is, uh, I'm happy with that. It's my own conscience that I probably have to answer to. But thank you for that very good question. While we're here talking about whistleblowers, I also wanted to mention the case of Richard Boyle, who is a tax office whistleblower. He exposed some of the dodgy practices of the Australian Taxation Office. Uh, and his case also, he's also up for prosecution. He goes to court next year. 7.30 recently covered some of the issues relating to his case. I remember hearing a knock at the door. Richard got out of bed and that was when I saw the police officer standing in my bedroom doorway. I could see his gun in his holster. Uh, yeah, I was, I was in shock. Why was it unethical? That meant, and I stated, that uh, we may be shutting down the wrong businesses and causing great distress to the community and possibly even pushing people towards suicide that um, needed our compassion as opposed to the people that we should rightly be ta uh, targeting with standard garnishes. He highlighted an email sent to 12 staff towards the end of a shift. The last hour of power is upon us. That means you still have time to issue another five garnishes, right? I was, I was horrified. Nine months on, Boyle was charged with offences, including taping private conversations without consent and taking photos of taxpayer information. If found guilty of the 24 offences, he will serve a cumulative 46 years in jail. Boyle, stand with Richard Boyle, stand with Richard Boyle. Boyle is one of two whistleblowers facing criminal charges by the Commonwealth. Whistleblowers make Australia a better place. They should be protected, not punished. Kieran Pender is a senior lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre, which advocates for whistleblowers. Richard Boyle goes to jail for exposing wrongdoing. That will have a real chilling effect on whistleblowers everywhere. People won't speak up about wrongdoing. People already aren't speaking up about wrongdoing because this is what they see, that it's not a good society to live in where people go to jail for telling the truth. The cases both of Richard Boyle and of David McBride are the subject of a major campaign which is currently on to try and pressure the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, to drop these prosecutions as is well within his power. If you'd like more information about this campaign, go to droptheprosecutions.org.au. The link is in the description below and uh, it's well worth supporting that campaign in many ways at the website. Also, don't forget that greenleft.org.au is a regular source of information about this campaign as well. Whistleblowers should be protected, not prosecuted. Drop the prosecutions. These were the words on a full-page newspaper advertisement in support of this campaign. You just see enough is enough, and, and you know that you're being bullshitted to. And um, I gave them plenty of chances in defence. I mean, I asked them, I said, what, what is going on here? That doesn't seem right. Why are we trying to put this guy in jail? Why are we not investigating Ben Robert Smith? Why, what, you know, and I did not get satisfactory answers. And I think that's when you really decide you're gonna to have to go for it, when you know you're being bullshitted to. It's not the very first time you see something wrong, but when you raise something and then, they made the mistake, they make the mistake of making you the problem. They start coming for you. They start saying, oh, we're gonna psychologically examine you. It, because it was actually the scapegoats that got me onto it. They had all these very suspicious murders in, in 2012. It turned out to be murders, suspicious incidents. Robert Smith and his, a few other people, in fact, not just him. Um, in 2013, they tried to put anybody in jail. And, uh, I thought that was strange. I thought, why are we not investigating? And I, and I, I tried to explain to a guy who just, uh, an SAS bloke, the leadership were trying to put him in jail uh, for murder and they weren't gonna investigate Ben Robert Smith at all. 
And that was strange. And I explained to the guy, I said, look, this is a political um, investigation here. It looks like they're trying to make you a scapegoat. The look that said it all, and the look, he looked at me as if, and he, as if to say, well, isn't it your job to do something about uh, a political bullshit prosecution? And first, I was defensive to say, oh, you know, not my problem, not my job. Um, you know, that's just the way it goes. And then uh, the look or the words kind of burnt into my soul because I knew he was right. It was exactly my job. I was the, I was the lawyer uh, for special forces. I was there, I was well equipped to do it. And it was exactly my job to do something about it. And, um, and I made up my moment from that. I, first, I went to see the commanding officer and I said, um, what's gonna happen? And he said that they, they're gonna try and jail him for murder. And then as soon as when the commanding officer said that, I said, I, I knew I didn't say anything. I said, thank you. I walked outside and I knew I was gonna go to war against my own country from that moment on. Yeah, you've gotta be brave, but the right thing to do is obviously um, uh, do your job. I mean, that's what I've always said. It's not really a matter of being a hero, but, but if you're a legal officer, um, and you're in Afghanistan and you see the government breaking the law, I mean, it's, it's absolutely your job to do something about it. It's not heroic, it's just your job. To his great credit, uh, David McBride has spent a lot of time recently speaking out in favour of uh, Julian Assange, whose extradition from Britain to the United States is currently dangerously close. Uh, here I wanted to highlight this is an occasion where David was speaking out in Sydney earlier this year. Are we gonna win? Are we going to win louder? Yeah. What do we want with Julian Assange? We want him free, don't we? Yeah. Free, free Julian Assange! Free, free Julian Assange! That's right. We are going to win this, and this is going to be like apartheid in South Africa. Everyone's going to want to think that they were part of it, but you were part of it. You were here. You can be so proud of yourself. Scott is right. There's a good chance that even though I reported murders and cover-ups, that I'm gonna to go to jail for the rest of my life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I've never been prouder. I've never been prouder of it. It's not something that you are, uh, thank you. It's not something I hang my head about. It is something I am proud of because we need to, well, you guys are here to stand up. You know we need to stand up. The, the future of the planet depends on it. It's not an exaggeration to say if the government can murder people and those people who report the government murdering people in turn get murdered and all the big media organisations don't support the murdered whistleblower like Assange and me, but they support the god-awful government. That's the world we live in. And I say this to Anthony but Albanese, enough of you saying enough is enough. It means nothing. It, imagine if I'd been seeing witness war crimes in Afghanistan, witness murder, witness covered up by people like General David Hurley, and all I said to them was, Oh, enough is enough. Enough is enough. It's not good enough. If you see someone getting raped and murdered, you don't go, enough is enough. You've got to step up to the plate. You've got to step up to the plate, Anthony Albanese. Otherwise, you will just be a forgotten Prime Minister, a Billy McMahon. A cross-party delegation of Australian MPs was recently in the United States pushing for freedom for Julian Assange. At this point, it really does seem that political pressure, including grassroots pressure from people like you and me, is going to be the only way that we will see freedom for Julian Assange. There are a number of events coming up where you can show support for Julian Assange and also David McBride, including a film screening in Lismore on October 13, a dance party in Melbourne on October 28, and a music festival in Canberra on November 12. Then the next day, November 13, there's gonna be a protest outside the court um, in Canberra uh, where when David McBride goes to goes to court. Details for all of these events can be found in the Green Left activist calendar. Before we go, I'd like to highlight some of the social media sources where you can follow the campaign in support of David McBride. Um, these include David Bird McBride on YouTube and Instagram, 
and davidmcbride.com.au on the web. All of those links are in the description wherever you found this episode of The Green Left Show. Don't forget also to follow greenleft.org.au and also on our Green Left social media uh, for more information about this campaign and other campaigns. And as I said at the beginning, if you do like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter. It is the number one way to support the work that we do and also to ensure you get the content that we produce. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.